Welcome back to the channel. In this video, we're going to talk about vulnerability management, and I'm gonna teach you all the high-level steps that are required to implement a vulnerability management function in a large organization. And I personally worked as a cybersecurity program manager heading up vulnerability management for a couple of years for the 12th largest county in the United States. The org I worked for was quite large and complex with over 30,000 network attached assets spanning several different departments, kind of with their own IT department as well, and that was spanning a relatively large geographic region in Washington. The the whole purpose of this video is to give you some context about vulnerability management. It will be especially useful for people going into interviews, whether or not it's vulnerability management or not. Um, the stuff you learn in this video will, will definitely help you a lot and give you a better intuition for what vulnerability management is, like how to do it. And you should feel more comfortable going into interviews after watching this video. I'm going to cover the high level steps required to kind of initiate a vulnerability management program. And then we're going to cover 10 possible interview questions that you might encounter related to vulnerability management. And before we get started, I just want to say this video is actually a part of my own hands-on cybersecurity course that I released this past April. The course is very hands-on in the sense that we actually create our own security operations center on the cloud and we configure a SIM from scratch and we practice incident response against actual live attackers and bad actors on the internet. It's very immersive, very hands-on, and it will help build a lot of intuition for actually what happens in cybersecurity operations. There's currently over 600 students in the course, and we have a very, very active Discord, which I hang out in regularly. And a few people have already gotten jobs, actually, even though the course was released only a couple months ago. Definitely check it out. I'll put a link in the description, as well as a discount code for a 10% off. So getting right into things, let's go ahead and define what exactly is vulnerabilities like simply put a vulnerability is just a weakness in any given system and a system could be literally anything so thinking about it in terms of your house which is really easy say that you live in a, a dangerous neighborhood and your house just doesn't have a lock on the door that's kind of considered a vulnerability and then translating that into the computer world you can kind of think about it as something wrong with a system that makes it easy for people to break in or compromise it this could be in the form of outdated software where it becomes easier for hackers to exploit and attack. This could be like some misconfiguration in your operating system. Like maybe you only require four characters in your password or maybe there's no password at all. And it could be in the form of missing software updates or like missing patches or something like this. These are kind of like the three main-ish areas of vulnerabilities for computer systems. You might've noticed sometimes when you're using your computer and Windows is like trying to automatically update and then it finally just does and re boots the computer when you're using it. That's actually Windows trying to remediate its own vulnerabilities at like the very core of things. Um, also, maybe you have an iPhone or an Android or something like this and it's trying to update iOS. That's essentially the phone trying to remediate its own vulnerabilities. Sometimes it's adding features, but a lot, most of the time it's patching some kind of security hole or some kind of weakness that exists in the system. The main goal of vulnerability management is to kind of reduce risk to what your org deems acceptable and kind of keep that risk there and it's possible like the risk can grow like if you add assets to your organization and don't practice vulnerability management on them or if new vulnerabilities are discovered like the risk will grow so the whole purpose of vulnerability management is to like remediate vulnerabilities with the goal of mitigating the risk and kind of keeping it to you know x risk level and from a tactical standpoint that is like you know physically going to the computer and doing stuff it is pretty easy to practice vulnerability management it's like quite easy right all you have to do is you know install patches or you know fix config or like allow windows to do its update like tactically speaking it's not that difficult to do vulnerability management but in reality it's not really so simple there's a lot of things that can really, really get in in the way of vulnerability management. So for example, if you have a very large complicated organization, more times than not, there'll be a lot of critical systems that rely on actual deprecated systems. And then when you fix the deprecated system, like you remediate the vulnerability, that in turn breaks the business critical system, I guess, that was relying on it. This happens a lot and it's really really difficult to deal with not only this but humans absolutely love getting in the way of vulnerability management it's probably the most difficult part of this whole process is kind of dealing with the different people and dealing with the different personalities because a lot of people are like protective of their systems or they, they don't want to patch it because you know they don't want to do work and like all, all of this stuff it's just a big process and it takes some effort and a lot of soft skills to kind of get through it which is what we're going to talk about in this video these are all things that you really need to consider when going into an interview about vulnerability management or trying to spin up your own vulnerability management function i notice a lot of 
A lot of interviewers like to ask things like, how would you deal with pushback for fixing a vulnerability? Or how would you deal with a department who, who doesn't you know, want to play nice with you and get on board with your program? Like, there's all kinds of questions about this. And the reason for that is that that's the actual reality of it. And there's, there's so much pushback in cybersecurity, like especially vulnerability management. It's just really good to kind of acknowledge that going into an interview and kind of have... Um, answers prepared that are conducive to, you know, getting along and, you know, doing what's best for the business at, at the same time. It's just kind of a, a challenge. So it's something that you have to kind of think about. So looking at this little graphic here, this thing describes the vulnerability management lifecycle, and this kind of assumes a program is already in place. So this discover, this is doing, you know, vulnerability scan, scanning of systems, prioritizing means some of the vulnerabilities will be super critical. Some of them will be low or, or nothing at all. And the system also comes into play, right? Some, some computers, some quote unquote computers are more important than others. So prioritize, assess, report on the vulnerabilities, remediate, that just means um, quote unquote fix them, whatever that means, like uninstalling the software, updating the software, updating the operating system, applying some kind of secure configuration. Verify just means essentially to rescan the system to make sure the, the fix worked and then discover again. So this is kind of the, the ongoing life cycle of vulnerability management. But before we can even get started on this life cycle, we have to do a bunch of other stuff first, right? We have to actually procure some kind of vulnerability management platform and like onboard all the devices and the departments. And there's just a bunch of stuff that needs to happen first. So that's kind of what we're going to cover in this video. So I kind of outlined these eight steps. I'm going to go over them really quick. Um, it's just something I made up, but it's really in line with industry and it's kind of based off my own experience standing up the vulnerability management function where I used to work. So the very first step of this would be initial planning. And this is really important. Um, it's just stuff you have to find out before you actually go and start trying to procure some kind of platform. You have to ask yourself questions like how big is the environment? What is your environment comprised of? Is it mostly just users with their laptops using cloud services? Or do we have our own infrastructure with servers? Is there any critical infrastructure that we're in charge of, like a 911 system or something like this? Like what is our what is our environment comprised of and how big is it exactly? The next step would be to start drafting up a vulnerability management policy for your organization. And the whole purpose of this is to kind of outline how you identify, classify, prioritize, and remediate vulnerabilities and kind of put some quote unquote rules on there that the different departments or your organization as a whole needs to flow. So when you start getting pushback, you can kind of point to the policy that you made that's hopefully been signed off by this the CIO or you know who's ever in charge of that being like yeah you have to do this or this is going to happen the policy is not going to be solidified at this point but you should start drafting it up and put the necessary things on it I'm going to include a sample vulnerability management policy for this in the description of this video feel free to take it and do whatever you want with it the next step would be to look at your organization and create a full asset list of everything you have and kind of tag the assets and by tag the assets, I mean kind of measure them in terms of their criticality, like how important they are, how business critical they are, what's going to happen if one of them goes down, something like this. This will help us when we finally get to the remediation stage of our vulnerability management program. Here's an example of a criticality chart. I just got this off of Google. It's something that you could potentially use to classify your assets. So for example, if you're like a, a local county or some kind of government and you operate a 911 system, right, and that system goes down, it's, it's possible that you someone will experience death permanent disability like some kind of loss of life because if the 911 system doesn't work like people they're going to die more than likely you can kind of go down this list and you can imagine classifying different assets so like the servers operating 911 system those would be in the catastrophic category maybe you have like a wastewater treatment plant or something like this and maybe that might fall into critical too because if, if that doesn't work maybe you know someone gets sick or the environment gets poisoned or something like just kind of an idea of how you could go about classifying your assets assets for your vulnerability management program. I suspect a lot of organizations do this differently, but there are some kind of guidelines that you can follow from, from Department of Homeland Security and, and other organizations like this. So now that you have a good idea of your organization's assets, the next step would be to start trying to procure a vulnerability management platform. So to do this, like I would recommend putting together some RFPs that is requests for proposals for some of the 
larger vulnerability management organizations. This might be something like Rapid7, Tenable, Qualys, something like this. So you put something together that says, for example, like I have 10,000 assets in my organization. You know, X percent of these are laptops, X percent of them are servers. We have a small amount in the cloud and we want licenses for you know 15% growth in the next year or something. Give us a quote, how much is this going to cost us? And it's really, really troublesome doing this part because it's really, honestly, in my opinion, it's really annoying dealing with salesmen. They're never going to tell you how much something costs. They're going to try to be like, oh, what's your budget? And then you're going to be like, oh, $200,000. Coincidentally, they're going to be like, oh, well, we have a package for like $195,000. It fits you perfectly. It's just really annoying to go through. So basically put out the RFPs through to whoever, you know, whoever you want to work with, whichever platforms that you think are interesting compare the numbers and see, you know, what they come up with. And it is possible to negotiate with them like on like licensing and like seating and like duration and things like this. Also the cheapest bid is like not always the best one. Um, so you just have to, you know, use your due diligence if you're, if you're the actual one like who's procuring it, but it's just something to keep in mind if it comes up in an interview or something otherwise. And the next step, which is really, really important and really critical is kind of getting people on board with your vulnerability management program. Depending on how large your organization is, you might have you know more than one IT department essentially with you know, these people dealing with these assets, these people dealing with those assets, and like maybe there's like a network engineering team and they have their own assets they deal with. Cloud engineers, maybe, maybe they have their own. It's not like there's one sysadmin for, for everything. So you, you have to talk to these individual departments. Maybe you talk to like a stakeholder and a technician from each one or an engineer from each one. Just let them know what you're doing. Like, oh, you know, we're spinning up a vulnerability management program. We need to start onboarding your devices. I want to be as transparent as possible and just kind of talk to them about it. From an organizational standpoint, like if you're the actual vulnerability management program manager and their assets fall under the scope, technically speaking, they, they have to implement the program, but you don't want to come across as you have like an iron fist or something. You're going to, you're going to make them do it. Talk about it like, oh, we have to do this. Um, I want to make it as easy as possible for your department and just be, be transparent because eventually you're gonna have to do what are called authenticated scans, which means you have to get some kind of service account or credentials for the stuff that they manage and plug those into the vulnerability management platform. So you just wanna, you wanna be as like transparent and as nice as possible and just try to create a, a collaborative environment. This will really reduce any pushback that you might experience in the future if you're, if you're just really collaborative and nice about it. And also in this phase, this is really important you should have the, the draft of your vulnerability management policy. It, depending on your organization, you can get feedback from them about your policy where you're outlining your timelines and stuff. And you can say things like, oh, like we're, you know, we want to remediate all criticals within 24 hours. We want to remediate moderates within 72 hours of discovery, like this type of thing, and try to get a temperature on whether or not they think their department has the capabilities to kind of maintain that cadence and to kind of deliver on those remediation and stuff like this. Because it's possible they just, they don't have enough staff and it's important to kind of communicate that to the appropriate parties because especially in the initial remediation phase, you might need to acquire some like contractors or something to augment their staff to help them kind of remediate those initial vulnerabilities. So it's really important to gather feedback about the vulnerability management policy at this phase before it's actually, you know, signed off by the CTO or CIO or, you know, whoever is in charge of it at your organization. So it's important to get feedback on that as well. The next step would be some training. This applies to you or whoever's essentially going to be using the vulnerability management platform. There will probably be a bunch of different users on it because, you know, people need to use it for reporting. They need to use it for actually doing remediations. People will be scanning it. There'll just be a lot of different roles and a lot of different people probably using your vulnerability management platform. So when you kind of figure out who those people are, you can either send them to like a vendor specific training, or in my case, I just kind of, for those specific roles, I just went through the documentation and put together some kind of initial training depending on their role. Like I kind of built one out for them 
And then I referenced the documentation and was like, if you need to know more stuff, you know, look here or you can just ask me or something. So that's kind of this phase, just kind of making sure everyone gets trained up. Finally, we have our platform and we have everybody trained and all the roles and responsibilities and everything fleshed out. We can finally start doing that traversal of the vulnerability management lifecycle. And this is the absolute most difficult part of this whole process. Because if you didn't previously have a vulnerability management function, like you weren't even doing it at all, the very first step, the discover step, when you do that initial scan, it's likely going to produce a, a staggering amount of vulnerabilities, to say the least. That would be an understatement. There's going to be a lot of vulnerabilities. And then after discovering these, you kind of have to start prioritizing them, right? So in order to prioritize, you're going to make use of the tags on the assets you made in the, in the very beginning. Like if you, you know, you're in charge of a 911 or some kind of emergency response system, or your, your organization isn't in, in charge of a power grid or something like this, you know, those are going to be the critical assets. And then when the scans take place, they're going to discover a wide range of vulnerabilities from like critical vulnerabilities down to like, you know, low priority ones. And you kind of have to prioritize which things you fix first based on a combination of like the criticality of the actual, you know, computer or, or asset they're on and the type of vulnerability. So a really like easy way to look at this is you want to look at your most critical assets first, like your power grid, waste water treatment, emergency services. And then from those, you want to fix the most critical vulnerabilities first and then kind of work your way backwards and work your way down, if that makes sense. So, for example, if you have a, a critical public facing system, a medium vulnerability on that might be more important than like a zero day vulnerability or a super critical vulnerability that just happens to be on, you know, some random user's computer. So typically look at the critical assets first and kind of move backwards from them. But it, it really just depends on your org, right? And like I said in the beginning, this part is way more difficult than it sounds like. You can't just you can't just go and fix stuff, right? Because a lot of stuff has interdependencies that you, you don't really realize until you patch something. So likely this stage is going to create essentially a change management nightmare where you have to go through a big process in order to fix certain vulnerabilities depending on like what kind of system they're on and you know what depends on them so you can't just go through and fix stuff you're likely going to experience a lot of pushback in this phase because people are not going to want to bring their systems down they're not going to want to risk patching it they're, they're just not going to want to do with it do anything with it at all they're going to adopt this mindset like Oh, it's been running fine this whole time. Like, why do I have to do anything? And then they'll they'll take that with them, or they'll they'll die on that hill. Essentially, it, it's just really really challenging. Because if you're if you're a nice person, you have to be like not mean, but you have to you know kind of put your foot down on those people, and you have to point to the policy. You have to get senior leadership involved. Sometimes it's just it's just kind of uh, really difficult. So this is something that you need to take into consideration when you're having interviews. It's more than likely the interviewer is going to ask you something about like receiving pushback or something like this. Also, the difficult thing about this stage is the amount of human power that's required to do that like initial remediation phase. It's more personnel required than to actually maintain the program once it has had that kind of initial remediation cycle. So a lot of the time, depending on your organ, depending on how bad it is, you may need to hire some contractors for, you know, one or two or even three years to kind of get through that initial phase. So that's that's just something to keep in mind as well. It's just like a lot of work suddenly. And a lot a lot of the time the departments will be like, oh, we don't have the, the power for this or we don't have the capability to do this. So we, we're just not going to do it. But you, they can't really do that because, you know, you're trying to stand up a, a program for a reason. So this might be something to bring up to management if you are, you know, the one in charge of standing up the program or something to talk about in the interview as well. And then finally, if you're able to make it through that kind of initial cycle and remediate, you know, quote unquote, all the vulnerabilities, congratulations, you've you've done the hardest part. And now all you have to do is just maintain that cycle. It is possible to get more proactive about things and like, you know, get better and optimize how you do vulnerability management. But getting through that first cycle is the absolute hard part. So if you're able to do this, uh, I would recommend patting yourself on the back for accomplishing something that I have never been able to accomplish. I actually quit my last job in the, the phase seven because to be candid, like people didn't want to work and I was tired of like wasting 
wasting my time essentially so if you can get through that phase like big congrats to you like let me know i'll send you like a, a cake or something like this and it's promised here are some vulnerability management sample interview questions the answers to these are just kind of example answers. It's not like the answer or the best answer. It's just something to kind of get you thinking about how you might answer the question. I might recommend going to ChatGPT and giving it some advanced prompt, like I'm gonna do XYZ interview. Like, what do you think about this question? What do you think about this answer? And you can kind of get it to elaborate or tell you more, give a, a different answer or a better answer. It's just a really, really useful tool and I highly encourage you to use it. I'll put some links in the description for some free CompTIA Security Plus practice questions as well as some free CISSP practice questions as well as a link to my hands-on cybersecurity SOC analyst course with the discount code JOSH10. So definitely check that out. I think all of these resources will help you a lot on your journey into cybersecurity. But yeah, thank you for watching.